Okay. Are you concerned about turnout, especially among blacks uh, in the election? You hear these polls. Are you concerned about that? I am always concerned about turnout, whatever election we are talking about. Because let us, in a moment where we thank everybody for what they did to turn out in 2020, appreciate that it takes an effort to turn out to vote. People have things to do. They have obligations. If somebody's working two or three jobs, if they've got you know, a bunch of children and they need to worry about who's going to take care of the kids while they go vote, or there are people have obligations every day. But the people who, especially the people who have most at stake in the election, are often the people who, who least have the luxury of taking time out of their day to do something that is not an immediate obligation. So I recognize that. And I recognize that when people make the effort to register to vote, to fill out that ballot, to go to the polls and vote, it is an effort that we should appreciate and be thankful for when they make it. Um, I'm worried about it because I also know that there has been a lot of effort and laws that have been passed to try and make it more difficult for people to vote. I mean, can you imagine, Rev? In the United States of America, we went through all these fights, the March on Washington, John Lewis, all that. And, and these so-called leaders who are so bold as to unapologetically propose and pass laws to make it more difficult for the American people to vote, the gall. So I do worry that we have to do everything we can to remind people of why it's important and also fight against those people who are trying to make it difficult. One of the things we're doing with the march is that we have co-chaired it anti-defamation yeah, that's great. Asian groups. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, Unidos. Yeah. Because I think, yeah. as you have always said through your career, uh, it's about bringing everybody together. The coalition. And if there's no coalition, there's no victory for That's any right. of us. And is that what you hope that despite all of the acrimony we're hearing from some circles, despite you being targeted, at least politically, mm -hmm. uh, is that what you hope in this hour yes. that we can do is get beyond whatever tribal differences mm -hmm. and fight for all of us? Yes, and when we look again if, as commemorating 60 years ago and 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 the, the movement as it was and, and fueled and inspired in those days, there was a strong commitment then to the coalition. And again, if you talk about the ingredients, the, the essential ingredients in a movement that is about progress, the coalition is one of the most essential, which is grounded in the understanding and belief that the vast majority of us have so much more in common than what separates us. And, and also, a certain level of faith to just understand and be guided by knowing that we all have a common purpose and a common destiny. And so let's do this together, right? When you think about, they call it Bidenomics, some of the stuff that mm -hmm. you and the president have done and the getting through the people. Uh, you're the vice president of the United States, mm -hmm. the vice president, mm -hmm. and you're at the official residence. When you wake up in the morning, mm -hmm. what do you think about? What does Vice President Harris have on her mind when she wakes up? I know how all Americans, based on where they are, have got a variety of things. But share with me, what is it that you have on your mind when you wake up every morning? Our democracy. Rev, I think everything is at stake right now. Um, when I think about democracy, I, I, I think of it as its nature is there's a duality, there are two pieces to it. There's one aspect of a democracy that is about strength. When a democracy is intact, it strengthens the people, it protects and fights for fundamental freedoms, individual rights. It's a it's a fight for order against chaos. It strengthens. On the other hand, democracy, incredibly fragile. 
it will only be as strong as our willingness to fight for it. And right now, there are many forces that are attempting to purposely, I believe, weaken our democracy, purposely attempting to erode a sense of um, pride in the fact that we as the United States have, have held ourselves out and, and have been considered to be one of the strongest democracies in the world. And right now, in the context of the world, people are watching, wondering, what is the future of democracy in America? And I mention that because I, I have been traveling the world. I have met with over 100 world leaders, mm. presidents, prime ministers, chancellors, and kings. And here's the thing about being the United States of America. When we walk in those rooms, we walk in those rooms, chin up, shoulders back, with the self-appointed and earned authority to talk about the importance of rule of law, human rights, democracy. But the thing about being a role model, people watch what you do to see if it lines up with what you say. Mm. So one of the things that is, the, one of the things I wake up thinking about is not only what an erosion of democracy will mean for the American people, what it will mean invariably for people around the world. Can you imagine? The, the, the young women who are fighting in a, in a country ruled by a dictator or an autocrat, and they're fighting for, for, for fun, just basic rights, and that autocrat looking at them and saying, well, you want to hold out the United States as your example? Look at what they're doing. You be quiet. Mm. Understand what this means. This is very much on my mind. And you've said frequently, not on your watch. Yes. Uh, we fought many women, yeah. blacks, others yes. to become part of this democracy. That's right. On your watch, you're not going to let it go back to pre-1950 days. I love my country too much, and I'm not giving up on my country. I'm not. Do you, do you feel that uh, the whole question of where we are in history, uh, one day, some young lady is going to look at your picture the way you look at Thurgood's picture and John Lewis' picture. What do you hope they look at and say? I hope they say that um, they should, that they will say, I can do anything, even if it hasn't been done before. I will not be burdened by what has been. I will believe in what can be. That's what I hope. What do you hope uh, that people will finally be able to say that this gesture uh, that you're most proud of that you've been able to do with the president? I know we have Bidenomics. And yeah. All. What, what are the things you're most proud of? There's a lot. This? I have to tell you, Rev, there's a lot. I mean, I'm proud of. For example, an issue I've worked on for, for a long time, the issue of maternal health, putting that on the stage of the White House, where we're talking about the fact that in one of the wealthiest countries in the world, we have the highest rates of maternal mortality, where black women are three times more likely to die in connection with childbirth, native women one and a half, or two times more likely, rural women one and a half times more likely, and we're putting in place a requirement that it be taken seriously. For example, when I first came in, basically I challenged the states, extend postpartum care for women through Medicaid from two months to 12 months. Only three states were doing it. Now over 35 are doing it, right? I'm proud of that, what that will mean every mm. day mm. for the health and well-being of families and communities. I'm proud of what we've done in terms of expanding access to capital for small businesses. I love small businesses. So back to my, who I am. So my mother worked very hard. My sister Maya and I, sometimes she you know, would have to work later on weekends. And we had a second mother who lived two, story, two doors down, Mrs. Shelton, who ran the, and we would go to Miss Shelton's to have dinner or whatever. Um, Miss Shelton ran the nursery school and we lived on the apartment on top of the nursery school. Ms. Shelton was a small business owner. Wow. And she was a matriarch of the community. 
She would hire locally. She mentored. I love our small businesses and the work we're doing, expanding access to capital for small businesses. And I could go on and on and on. There are many things that I'm proud of that we have done that have been, I think, in many ways, and I say this humbly, that have been transformational for our country. Well, 60 years later, <laughs> a uh, story I heard growing up in the movement was how they didn't let women speak mm -hmm. at the march. Well, they'll be speaking this march, but more important, there's a woman of color in the White House that speaks for democracy every day. Come a long way in 60 years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rev.